What is going on traders? Uh, welcome back. This is the May monthly recap. Um, I talked about last recap being my first or in, or in April being my first, you know, red month in over five years. Um, this month we are back. We're back green, which is really great to see. Although I was actually break even, you know, really until the last week, you know, I, I, I you know, first week was six grand small week. Second week was a pretty big week at, you know, 70, almost 70 grand. Next week gave, you know, a lot of it back at negative 40. And then with borrow fees, you know, I, I pretty much just break even. And actually, I'm, I was kind of actually at a loss, um, which I'll go into in one of my trades. Um, but it wasn't until last week where I pulled out a huge win, which we will talk about once we get to the end of the video, that really ended up being my entire month. And and this, this reminds me a lot of the summer of 2019, where a lot of my months turned out like this, you know, and there's nothing wrong with it, even though internally it feels a little bit uh, scarce, right? I would love from a comfortability standpoint, be able to kind of take a bunch of trades throughout the month and have that, you know, lump sum of trades be my entire month versus one big winner. Um, and in many ways, if I just avoided some bigger losses this month, that would have been the case. But, you know, I can't always have control or have, or have control over how the month goes. And it turned out just the one big trade at the end made made it the best or made it the entire month. So um, there's a lesson in that that we'll have to go through throughout this video. And then also the other lesson that I really realized just how, I mean, I already knew this, but it's a good thing to, to always remind yourself of, of just how a small margin of error trading is, right? I, and we're going to go through these trades, but just, I can think of just off the top of my head, like three or four different decisions being made could have led this month to be drastically different. And I'm talking like just the three or four different decisions made in certain trades, um, again, that we'll go over, uh, could have easily led this to being like a 200K month, easily double a month, easily. If we just kind of changed things around, made some better decisions, made some, picked some bigger risk management, and all you know out of that, how much better month. So just it just goes to show, at least from a trader of my size, how, I mean, how crew, how much of a performance game this is if you're discretionarily trading if you're an algo trading it's different but just the the, the quick split decision to sec second or decisions that you make uh can really change things in your trading so it's a good thing because it can turn out really great or it's a bad thing and it can you know lead your results to be not nearly as good as they should have been which is a good case for this month but again we are green much rather have months like this than months like april april was much tougher much more brutal and uh and so let's get right into it uh week one Really don't remember anything significant about this week. You know, it was a small green wake, uh, small wins and losses all around, um, but nothing really memorable. So I kind of passed right by that week. This week, a lot went on. The second week, a lot happened, and we'll start right from right with Monday uh, on Rivian. Um, so Rivian, for those who don't know, is a EV company, and they IPO'd back in 2021 in November, and huge run. I mean, from 100 to 180. And at its peak, uh, Rivian, I think its market cap was worth more than I, like the top five automobile companies behind Tesla. I mean, if for a company that hadn't put any cars on the road yet, this thing was massively overvalued. And so I did make some money. I believe I talked about this in my recaps back in November. I would, I would check that out. Um, maybe I didn't make one. I don't remember. But I did, really did short this. Made some money. Um, didn't trade it too much throughout this period. However, I did make a mental note, though, is that with some, some IPOs, um, they have lockup shares. And what lockup shares are is that insiders and other people who, who invested in the company early, you know, have a 180 day ruling period where they can't sell their shares after the, until the, or once the IPO starts. So um, to, to ensure like that insiders don't just dump right on the IPO, they are limited to 180 days that they have to hold their shares. So instead of selling all throughout this period, they had to wait pretty much six months. And six months period came up right at the end of this month or the beginning of this month at May 9th. And, you know, I've seen examples like this before. If we go to like what uh, BYND, I think was one. BYND was one that was an IPO that was same, same thing, like just got super, super overvalued. And uh, and once its IPO came, or once its IPO lockup shares became available, uh, it dumped pretty hard. And I think that was right here where you see it was at 104 and then immediately gapped down to 82. Um, yeah, the big volume day. So so once insiders can sell and if it's still overvalued or they, they just wanted to lock in profits, um, they're going to absolutely do that. And so being Rivian still at 30 bucks at the time, um, you know, way less under or way less, not as overvalued as it was up here, clearly, clearly uh, but still, you know, insiders own this from much, much lower prices, right? So they're going to take profits. I, I anticipated that. 
And so if we go into my trades, I actually got short the day before. I got short on the 6th here, anticipating that Monday would be, you know, it's like, it's kind of an advantage for a retail trader because you're able to get short or sell before everyone else is, at least for the insiders who want to sell and take profits. So I was able to get short um, before we go right here. So this is on the 6th, this is the day before. Now, my thesis going into today was I just want to be short overnight. You know, I don't really necessarily care the price. I want to just be able to not stop out of my trade because the whole thesis around the lockup shares is to take it overnight, to short it overnight. And so unfortunately, that did hinder my entries a little bit. I did get a little bit scared and started shorting near the lows and versus near the top because when we actually started like bouncing from the top, I thought to myself, mm, am I going to have to stop out? You know, am I going to have to try to just stop out and reshort higher if it wants to you know, run the day before the lockout or lockup? Um, so my entries were a little bit more skittish versus being more proactive and into strength. Um, but I did add as we were weak into the close and great, 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 perfect week close. I think my average ended up being around like the mid 29s. Um, so it was up about a dollar a share into the next day. We gapped down huge. I mean, we closed at what, 29 here, tw high 28s. We uh, go as low as 22 pre-market, 22 and a half. And I cover some there. Uh, spikes out the open is a little bit choppy. I kind of give up, cover some, and then I play around with a little more, but didn't really make or lose much in this period. And ultimately locked in like 23 grand. So huge, huge, awesome win to start off the that week. Um, kind of my first lockup trade. I've only seen it happen a few times before with BYND. Um, Tilray, T-L-R-Y was one back in, I think two or three years ago. Uh, so it's just something I've seen, but I haven't really taken to practice. So the fact that I could do it for this trade was really sweet to see. Um, does it happen for all IPOs? No, but, but usually the over ones that are tend to be very overvalued, um, and have lockup and a lockup period, um, end up being a pretty good opportunity. So that's that that's on the Monday, the ninth here, um, Tuesday, the 10th, I took a quite bigger loss than I expected. Um, now it wasn't like it wasn't a loss like the nearly $70,000 loss I took in April being just stubborn and breaking all my rules. This loss was was somewhat accounted for and was part of the strategy that I was taking part in. Um, it was just a little bit, some factors that were out of my control and um, and slightly too big a sizing, I, I will admit. So TN Owen um, is what I would call and many would call like a, a WeChat pump, a China pump. Um, th this particular setup has been relatively new for me, um, only in the last year have I really seen it happen. It's probably happened before before that, but I really haven't paid attention and started learning it until then. And really haven't started le learning it seriously in the last maybe month or two. Uh, even though I've known about it for the last maybe year, um, I haven't, I've kind of ignored it and I've only taken bigger interest in it because it's happening much more frequently this year. Um, and unfortunately there's positive and negatives to that. Positively, you know, I'm learning a new setup. It's great, it's awesome. I'm making some money. Negatively, a lot of people want to learn this new setup and it gets very impacted, very crowded, and it makes these actually a lot more difficult. TN Owen um, is a perfect example of that. So essentially what happens is not always, but newer IPO companies that were supposed to IPO down at three, four, five bucks, six bucks, end up opening, you know, four, five, six hundred percent higher, right? I think TN Owen's um, IPO price was like five or four bucks. You know, and you see its IPO price when it opens, it opens at 22, uh, you know, immediately a 4X or a 5X above where it should have opened, right? And usually what they do is they trade around, they'll trade up, they'll trade down for a little bit, and then they'll, they'll just sell off tremendously like it did today or on the 15th or the, the 12th. And essentially what it means or what it is, is that they're, you know, and I'm heard maybe I'm not the perfect trader to, to, to describe this, um, but either they have shares from obviously from very low prices um, and there is no lockup, right? So they can kind of just dump when they want. However, they need liquidity, right? And so what they'll do is that it's very similar to OTC pumps. They'll kind of either in a chat room or mainly these are chat rooms, but in OTC pumps, they'll do it through like a, a, a newsletter or through a email service or a through, through an article online. That's how OTC pumps will do it. With China pumps, they'll kind of just try to gather a, a pool of retail investors through like chat rooms or through um, just messaging apps and trying to get them all to buy. And when they all to buy, they end up selling into them, leaving them with the bag, bag holding their this stock, and them selling their shares from, you know, for a 10x gain, right? Or from the IPO price of five for a 4x, 5x gain, right? And so if me as a short seller, I wanna be short these. I would love to short as, you know, the, the insiders are selling um, and, and profit on the way down, correct? Um, so, unfortunately, 
as I'm learning these, it, it's it's how I play them and how I want to play them going forward is different over the over the past few weeks because based on the float, based on how many shares there are to short, um, a lot of factors I didn't account for that I should have because I do account for those factors with OTC pumps. And it's like I kind of had to go through this learning curve to learn it for listed pumps or for China pumps. So to thinking when it opened up in the mid 20s, I was like, okay, let me put on like a starter swing short um, just in case it dumps and I'm not looking, right? Kind of like the FOMO, like I don't want to miss it. Um, let me have some starter shorts on and uh, and then when it dumps, I'll, I'll just, you know, make some money, right? Very, very kind of silly, not thought through plan. Um, but when I short these and I swing them with OTC pumps, I'm usually willing to risk, you know, give or take 100% on my position. I'm putting a smaller position, smaller dollars position wise. And if it goes up 100% against me, you know, I'll either cut it, I'll box it, um, or I'll just let it ride out, depending on how big my position is. So, unfortunately, I probably wasn't the only one who had that idea, and many other traders also shorted it. And there were buy-ins. I believe there were buy-ins on this day. There were a couple of buy-ins between this day. And so instead of a stock going sideways or kind of just being a little bit neutral till the actual dump day, it's untrending. And I still have my shares. Unfortunately, I get bought on this top day. Now, it does sell off quite decently, so I do get bought in, I believe, near closer to 40 rather than 50 that or 56. That would have been way worse. Um, but either way, still took a, a roughly $36,000 loss. And it is out of my control. You know, I did get bought in. I, I have no control over that. Had I not get bought in, you know, I would have probably been a $36,000 win or, or more um, being down at five bucks. But I just have no control of it all over it. Uh, the borrows on this one were lower. So it's something I need to kind of maybe pay more attention to if borrows are, are cheaper, if I find other traders all want in at the same stock, kind of the same play, um, and it gets impacted, like that's how squeezes happen. And even though the volume wasn't big on these, um, in many ways, this was a squeeze, right? And so I did take that loss. Um, thankfully, I was able to re-add at a different broker. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't fortunately never able to reshort at the broker I got bought in at. Um, so I did take, I have to take the full loss there. However, I did end up making almost all my, or all my money and some back on the dump day. Um, if we go, that's the daily chart that I covered. Um, but here is the actual dump day. This day right here is actually this day right here. Um, if we go into the chart, if we look uh, right here. So um, essentially what happens is, like I said, they, they, they want to get retail investors to to buy all at once to kind of bring in that liquidity for them to sell hence why you see this massive share care or a volume share candle or i don't know what i'm saying volume shares <laughs> i'm brain foggy it's been a long day but you see a big volume candle right here okay this is pretty much retail and the insiders trading hands right they're pretty much i mean and i'm not in any of these chat rooms i'm not in any of these like social media or um messaging services that are like telling me to buy. Although I know other traders who have signed, not signed up, but have joined them to see just to talk. Like it'll be these people. And like, I've, I've seen other people talk about how um, they'll try to like build a relationship with you, even though they just want you to buy stock. But if you play along, they'll tell you, you know, what stock to buy and ends up being the, the actual pump they're trying to do. I, I don't care enough time to do that. I know, I just know from word of mouth and from other chat rooms I'm in that these are usually the ones to play. Um, if you want to have fun with it and be investigative and chat with people who actually tell you to buy, you know, be your, knock yourself out. But, um, but they'll tell them all to buy at like a certain price. And this volume is essentially those retail investors buying at that price, exchanging hands with the people who are inside the, the pump selling into them. And so once that happens, that's when I add, that's what I want to take, you know, preferably I don't want to swing at all. And I just want to add here. That'd be the easiest way to do it. Um, and that's kind of what I did here. Um, and it panicked nicely, never came back, was a pretty straightforward one. Um, didn't cover this day, but covered the next day on this daily chart right here, uh, around like seven bucks. And that was that, you know, I made 54,000 on this kind of this rebuttal, this uh, second chance, and I lost 36 on the buy-in. So ultimately up around 20 or 20 grand on it or so. Um, so I'll take that any day. But this is just one of the, the, the few, like in some small margin of error where it's like, if I just, didn't swing or if I just kind of dodged a buy-in or, or, you know, unfortunately this was one a little bit out of my control. I can't control a buy-in, but I can control that I chose to swing. And some cases it's good to swing, some cases it's not. In this case, I should have avoided swinging for the fact that many traders wanted to short it and the amount of borrows available were low. Um, so it's one of those things where if I just didn't swing, 
or didn't uh, get bought in, I mean, that's a 36 grand difference, um, even more so if I actually profited from those shares. So one of those things where it really matters, um, vice versa on the other side of things. If we go keep going, um, on May 11th, you do see a th almost a 23 grand profit. Um, this one's a bit different. Uh, I didn't actually profit this money on this day, but because how I track my trades, there's no other really day for me to track it. Um, and I'll go into that. So so what, what, what really happened here? Um, INTV is a crappy OTC stock that is Bitcoin and crypto related. They, I believe they mine Bitcoin, um, or at least try to. And back in 2021 here, early 2021, I actually started buying something for a long term, not long term, but for a sector momentum swing as Bitcoin was going crazy, right? And I was right. I mean, I had like a, a 10 to low, low 10, 11 or 12 cent entry um, and it skyrocketed <laughs> and it went to up to 80 cents. I think at, at the peak, I was up like 100 grand. Uh, just, just and probably one of my best swings or best multi you know, percent winner, well over 100 percent winner I've ever had. And I remember selling about like a, a fourth of my position. About a, maybe a third at most. And because I sold so much, um, if you actually, if you go back, let's go back even more. Um, back when Bitcoin went crazy in 2017, this thing hit seven. Now, was I thinking this is gonna hit seven again? No, but I thought, you know, if it got really insane, it can go over one, maybe two bucks. And so I sold a little bit here, but I wanted to hold the rest thinking, you know, the higher Bitcoin goes, the more insane this is gonna get. Now, unfortunately, if you've been following Bitcoin, didn't happen, right? It played many different, different, different or different uh, circumstances played out with them with China banning mining, that caused a fifty percent pullback. Um, back in November, Bitcoin just made pretty much double top and then pulled back another fifty percent. Um, and so once that happened, you know, unfortunately, I just stopped watching it. And in many ways, I was just kind of waiting. Oh, when Bitcoin comes back, I'll sell the rest of it. You know, really just totally stopped caring about the money on this, which. In some cases, is what led me to even ride it out this high, right? If I cared about the money, I would have sold it all on this breakout day because I would have been like, oh my gosh, I'm up well over 100%. I need to sell. Um, so if I cared too much about the money, I wasn't going to make it this far. But the problem is I cared so little that I pretty much let it all come back. Now, the good part is because I sold at least a third up here, um, it was free money in a sense. Like if this thing went to zero and I sold the rest of my shares to zero, I still would have made money. Now, what reminded me of it? Well, Bitcoin dropped another, you know, whatever 30% it was down in below 30K, back below the 2021 summer lows. Um, and that kind of made me realize and remember that I had this swing on and I'm like, holy crap, like, you know, Bitcoin's not coming back for at least a year or two. Like, why would I still swing this piece of crap for that much longer? Um, so I did end up selling, pretty much sold for a little bit, a few cents below my entry uh, or my average. Um, so I did get take a little bit of a loss or give some gains back there. But ultimately, overall, I did still lock in 23K on that trade. Um, but like I said, I locked it in kind of around this area uh, over a few days up in here. So this was almost a year a year ago, but I also never tracked it a year ago. I kind of just like it was free money. I was like, oh, I locked some in. Let me just see where it goes. And I was, it was dumb. I, I let it go all the way back down. So very stupid, very, very big, costly mistake. Luckily, like I said, free money left me to still be green, but it led me to not care really at all. Um, that's the double edged sword here. You got to find a nice little middle ground of caring about the money, but not caring too much where you sell too early or sell for sell without outside your plan um, or not follow your plan here. I kind of just didn't care at all. And I forgot about it. Um, so mistake there, but it happened. So I am tracking it. I did track it on the 11th. That's when I officially kind of sold everything. It's the day I closed out the trade completely. Um, that's how I like to track. And that's the easiest way for me to track. So, um, didn't necessarily lock in those gains, like I said, but I put it there. So even without this day, you know, up 86 grand in a month. Um, so it's a way to put it that way. Uh, if we keep going, like I said, so that's pretty much the second week. Uh, like I said, 54 grand, this is when TNON dumped and I covered. Um, so if we move on to the third week, took another big loss on the 18th, which was uh, BGXX. Now BGXX wasn't necessarily the same as these other typical China pumps. Yes, it had the same idea that its IPO price was much lower. I believe it was like six or five. Um, it did open up much higher. However, there wasn't necessarily a plan for them to kind of dump on retail. Um, it was more of an IPO that just didn't have a lockup restriction, kind of like Rivian did, RIVN. And so once kind of the selling started, it didn't stop. 
right? Because insiders can just sell as much as they wanted. As you can see, there's no like really big, big, huge sell candle volume over the others like you saw on TNON um, because there was no chat room. There was no one promoting or trying to get retail to buy. It was simply just insiders waiting to kind of all pan it together and just dump it because they just went out because they're up way more than they should have been. And as you can see, it's back down at three, 360. Um, so the mistake I made was, again, part of the learning curve, thinking this was a China pump. I thought it was without doing any due diligence, without like looking into uh, talking to other traders I know, without looking on Twitter, without looking at their financials and, and who um, who was behind it per se. Um, and so when it when it pan when it pulled right here, um, I got short. If we go to my trades, I got short right here, and I got short a little bit too much size than I wanted. Um, because like I said, like I said before, if you if you get if you nail some of these China pumps correctly, I mean you're pretty much going to nail the top, not the top, but you're going to be up right away. Um, given they don't come back on you and given me it's the actual dump. Uh, and of course that wasn't the case. Uh, it came back, I gave it some time, but eventually I realized like, this is not it. I finally did due diligence that I should have done realizing that this was not a China pump. There was no chat room promoting this. Um, so I covered and unfortunately it was a, a well over 40 grand loss, just way too big a size should have been probably half or even a fourth of this, um, to take only like a 20 or 10 grand loss. Um, but thankfully, this is really a good cut because had I been stubborn like other traders would have, um, it would have been a much bigger loss up here. Um, and this is me just like scalping some some parabolic moves, some spikes. Um, and actually, this this ended up being the top. And part of me kind of felt that way because this volume got really, really big. It almost felt, seemed like other, again, similar to TNON, other short sellers that were stubborn were kind of also getting blown out or getting squeezed up in here. Um, so this little entry right here, if I had held, probably would have made me back this loss had I uh, held it and then covered into you know this day right here. Now, what are you saying? Now, you know, you might be like, Kyle, that's hindsight. Of course, you can see it, of course, in hindsight. But part of me thought about that. Part of me actually thought about holding this only because the pullback into the close. Unfortunately, I just got a little bit timid and did cover it. Um, but had I held, I mean, even a second longer, it would have pulled $5 a share from, from low 40 or low 50s to high 40s. Um, and that was the move. I mean, this was the blow off. This was the exhaustion. Um, and the next day, like it's like you see here, it gapped down huge. And the biggest mistake of all of them wasn't necessarily not keep staying short here. Um, it was not reshorting, you know, in the morning. Um, now, granted, did I know it was going to dump? No. But at the, again, the same prices, like I knew there was no lockup. I knew insiders, once they start selling, they're not going to stop. Um, and so not trusting it and just reshorting it and maybe risking, risking the day high or risking red green. Um, was the mistake because if I had shorted, I probably would have made back my loss, if not more. Um, again, that doesn't take away the fact that I was just way too oversized to begin with. Uh, but again, it just comes back to those, those those key decisions that you choose to make on sizing, on on game planning, on whether you should re-enter a short. Um, it all ties in together. And I and I fortunately I think because I was just too, I t went too big a size here. I kind of really exhausted myself and got scared to even consider reshorting here. Uh, turns out, again, couldn't have been a bigger mistake. Um, faded absolutely beautifully with little to no bouncing. And, you know, if you wanted to be even more patient, even a week later, a week or two later, we're down at all time lows at three bucks. So um, quite a huge miss, bigger, much bigger loss than I wanted or, or needed. Um, but it is what it is. I can handle it. And, you know, it's only given back a week's worth of trades. It wasn't like, you know, this week where I, I mean, gave back a whole month, if not more. Um, so. That was pretty much the most eventful thing on this day. Um, besides actually VEDU, this, I, I think I had this up because I wanted, this was another China pump that actually, this was a China pump that happened on the same day that BGXX did, um, at least on this day. And I remember VEDU, I totally butchered it. Uh, you know, I did have some short, but I, I was way undersized on this one versus way oversized on BGXX, uh, did not, hold it at all nearly long enough down to the lows. If we go to my trades, I'm pretty sure I covered it super freaking early. Um, yeah, here it goes here. You know, so got short, uh, bounced huge, which again is not normally what they happen, but they can do that. And so when they did that, I, luckily I was small size. I mean, this ad, this candle looks terrible, but this was like a couple hundred shares. It was nothing big at all. Um, and then you see the actual dump, like this candle here. This is when the actual shares exchanged hands, similar to what I was talking about with TNON. Um, and so when that happened, I tried adding, but again, 
you know, covered a little bit and then it tried bouncing. And this bounce again really scared me out of this bounce again. I'm like, man, if this bounces again like this, like I do not want to be in this choppy mess. So I covered it all. That was the top, guys. Uh, that was the last price you would ever see. That was the last, you know, price of stock of that stock that you'd ever see again. And it did nothing but fade from, you know, the mid 11s all the way down to five by the end of the day. Um, so again, that was another five figure mistake for me. Um, and now how much did I make from this trade right here? I made like a hundred dollars. I, I mean, literally made like nothing. Um, just, just, and I partly, again, I think I was timid from the fact that, you know, I, I just took this huge loss on BGXX. I, I wasn't well planning and wasn't like trading well in general, just from this. And again, it being affected by GBXX, like I just picked, I picked the wrong one. And when you pick the wrong one, you get, you get on tilt. Um, and I think that's was hundred percent the case for me. Um, so I just blew it. I just really blew it. Um, you know, it's not the end of the world, but it is something I had to deal with. And again, just comes down to those, this, this theme of this video is the, the little tiny mistakes that, um, can really change drastically your month. Right? So let's just keep moving on. Um, last week here. So two main plays of this week that really contributed to this, this big, this big winner, um, and a loss, which I'll go over very similar to INTV, which is BGI. Uh, but the first one is GVO, GOVX. GOVX is actually a nice supernova runner that we haven't really seen much of. Um, you know, like I mentioned, these these China pumps have kind of been like the the, the, the setup, of, the new setup of the year. Um, we haven't seen many great supernovas besides, or any great sector momentum besides the oil sector in March. Um, this this mini sector was between SIGA and GOVX with with monkeypox kind of the fear around monkeypox and if it's going to be like the next COVID, you know, the media runs with it um, and whether it's actually serious or not. Um, but so, but, but because of that, it's kind of leaves opportunity for um, the stock market, right? Stocks that are, are promising or typing themselves up saying, Hey, we can help fight monkeypox or we can help fight this new disease or we have a vaccine for this new disease coming out. Like they are going to be hot. They're going to be popular. So that's definitely something to look forward, you know, going in the future. If it's not monkeypox, say it's a whole other disease, like companies who are associated with that disease, will be getting attention, right? And so GOVX did get attention. Um, my trades on it, I actually got chopped up on it to start. Um, if we go here, um, you know, shorted pre-market as it was, as news came out, I forget what the news was, but it was something about, um, I don't even remember, but it was, it was again, it was, it was monkeypox related. Um, started good short pre-market, risking red green, it went red green, so I said, okay, let's cut it. Um, tried shorting into some spikes, tried shorting into seeing if it was going to fail, um, clearly around here. And it just didn't, unfortunately, after like, what is this five or six tries I had, um, I lost about 10 grand on it. So 10 grand is a little bit too bigger of a, of amount of loss I would have liked to take on this, but that's what happens when you take five tries and lose two grand each, each try. Um, so just really the mistake was just having too many tries. I really should have stopped after the pre-market and this spot the morning, I shouldn't really have retried it again with all this action here. Um, you know, a four to six grand loss would have been a little more acceptable. Two to three tries is usually what I like to give a setup or, or at least an attempt on a, on a stock to where I think it might go. Um, so again, like I said, too many tries, negative 10 grand. Um, one more try here, lost like a thousand. And unfortunately I kind of, again, this is very similar to me not doing my DD, which was, um, in their filings, they had warrants that they can sell or that they can dilute. But the problem is the stock had to hit, I believe it was like 320 or it was like 319. It was somewhere in the low threes and the stock had to hit. And once they hit that, their warrants are now accessible, are being are allowed to be exercised and they can exercise them. And so what happened? It goes exactly to just the mid 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 uh, or low low threes. And right when it hits that, it just dumps, right? Just, just pulls back hard. Um, and once I realized that, once I realized that was the game they were playing, it, again, it wasn't about monkey box, um, even though that's what they you make it to look like. Uh, the reality is they just needed to, to get rid of their shares, right? The insiders. Um, and so once I realized that, and once I realized there was a huge resistance in three, they just kept selling into three. Um, I realized that's what they wanted to do, like I said. And so I got reshort with a better, much better plan saying, you know, they, they probably won't take it over three very strongly. And they certainly won't take it over the high day, which was my area of risk. Um, so I got short, faded beautifully, covered a little bit here um, and held the rest overnight. And if we go here, um, next day, it didn't really gap down that big. Uh, if we actually go to my trades, let me just exit this out. I remember adding, 
because I'm just thinking to myself, this is this is going to die. They, again, the whole point, right, I said, was for to them exercise their warrants. Once they've done that, there's there's no reason for this thing to be up anymore. Um, even though, again, the monkeypox deal, like I said, but again, that's that wasn't why they even had it up in the first place. Be, the behind the scenes reason was the warrants. So I did add, I ended up getting my average from the high twos to about the, the a little bit lower, like 270, 280. Brought my average down like 10 or 20 cents. Um, throughout this period, I was actually losing faith. I was like, mm, this is not dying. Why isn't it dying? Um, should I be cutting? But again, it was holding above these, under these 270s beautifully. I said, unless this doesn't squeeze late day, like there's no reason why I should cover. Um, again, the thesis was they've done what they needed to do. Just stay patient for them to pull back. And midday, they actually do another offering um, beautifully. Cover that into the lows here. Um, pretty much end up making nine grand. So pretty much made like 19. But again, after that 10K loss, 10, or from those too many attempts in the early in the morning the day prior, um, you know, had I made that back. And because when you swing something, at least at the broker that I shorted this with, they combine all your trades into one um, if you swing it. And so I ended up with nine grand. Um, so happy to be green, happy to have stayed patient and followed. Finally, once I realized what they were doing with the warrants, follow a much more better and concrete plan versus just giving this thing 10, way too many, not 10, five tries, way too many tries either way. Um, so I'm very happy with that to give this kind of just a reset, form a better plan and end up working beautifully. Um, so that's one that that's there. Now my big winner here to pretty much again, like I said, make my month, um, was CLEU. This one was another form or China pump on the chat room. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to uh, the laptop legend, um, David. Uh, he's, I think, laptop legend on YouTube, laptop legend on Twitter. Um, he's also in the chat room in the breakouts and breakdowns. Um, very good trader. Uh, knows these kind of China pumps inside and out. Um, he certainly has helped me tremendously with my learning curve learning them. Um, he can explain them and know them way better than I do. So go check out his channel. But he was kind of giving me the scoop on CLEU that it wasn't the same as like an IPO, right? It wasn't the same as TNON or BGXX. Um, it's already an existing stock as you can see, but insiders or not even insiders, the promoters of whoever they are, it doesn't really matter who they are, have shares from well under a dollar. I think it's like, I think they had shares from like 80 cents. Um, and now this thing's at three and all they're doing now is looking for, again, a liquidity exit. They're looking for people to sell to to get their exit and then be done with it, right? Make their money and kind of screw over the, the people, which again is totally borderline gray area and illegal, right? It's very similar to OTC pumps. Like if, you, if they can get away with it, they will, um, but if they get caught, they'll be in trouble, right? So um, so I was watching this. I was watching this for kind of the same idea as TNO and just a different kind of structure. And the first day I shorted was on the 19th because they did actually dump some shares there. If we go here. Um, as you can see, you know, they bring in this huge volume, not necessarily so much one just share candle, um, but tremendous amount of volume. And so I end up getting short in the kind of mid twos around 250 or so. Um, it dumps, I end up adding to this bounce to bring my average down. Um, but once I realized late day, I was like, mm, this is not breaking down. They are kind of just slowly selling rather than selling all at once on one big day. I did downsize. And that's kind of what, a, this is kind of the lesson I learned from TN Owen instead of swinging. And I realized if I'm going to swing, there one needs to be plenty of shares to borrow, shares to short, which there were. Um, but even then, I only want to take a small amount of size swing-wise. And I'm only then going to add on confirmation, right? So I took full confirmation size during this play, during this morning action. But once late day, once I realized it wasn't working, size back down to swing size, kept my swing size, and let it happen. Um, again, another another day where they brought in some volume, more like TNON. I did add here. Um, it kind of worked. Uh, held held that overnight thinking it was going to work. Came back, I downsized again. So it's like this constant like in and out of, is it going to work? Cool, keep my size on. If it's not going to work, size back down to swing size because I don't need this thing to coming back to me, on me, back over three, back over to new highs and taking a loss that I am not accepting, willing to accept, right? Um, same thing here. Uh, this actually was a quite a large candle. I actually thought this was it. So I did that again. Um, again, wasn't the case. They held it up. Uh, so I did downsize again. Um, finally, after apparently, I mean, again, it's, I'm not ex an expert on this, but at, finally, I guess the insiders had sold enough shares. They had you know, found enough liquidity in terms of retail to sell to. Finally, they started doing it. And you see, you know, this 800 share, share candle, the 600 share can, or 600K share candle, another 600K share candle, right? They're, they're, again, this is them trading and exchanging hands. And so finally, if I look at my, look at my trades here, 
Um, let's get rid of GOVX. That's the daily chart where I finally cover it all. Um, here's that day, right? And so here's me adding in confirmation size that we, you know, we see all these, 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 um, these blocks of volume going through. And instead of saving it, this is when they actually finally let it go. And I, and I cover a good size, a good portion of my size down here. I add a little bit back to the close. Uh, again, the next day we go even lower down to just sub one. I cover a little bit here, um, but eventually cover most of my size into this pop, uh, which is what you see right here on this daily chart. Uh, and so a total, I made it like just exactly over a hundred grand on it. Um, and so, yeah. I took a lot of size. I, I didn't. I didn't swing that size. I kept adding and taking it off, depending on whether it was actually working or not. Um, so I, I got the best of the world, where I stayed safe, but then also pushed it when the time was there. And so that's probably this is probably my biggest, you know, pump win, um, at least for this new setup. Like, yes, did I make fifty four grand on TNO? And yes, but again, I lost about thirty six grand. All the previous pumps I've tried, I've either failed misery, like VEDU. Um, taking a big loss like BEG, BGXX, um, or if I had a small win. CLEU was the, really the first time where I've haven't take I didn't take any like really stupid ridiculous losses trying to learn it or trying to get time it well, and then came out with a really really nice big win. Um, so will this happen all the time? Probably not. You know, like I said, th this is kind of like the setup of the year. A lot of traders want to be a part of this, and for for, the, for totally understandable reasons like. If you're a short seller and you know how to and you understand this this kind of setup like it, it's it's a good way to make money but the problem is i think every single pump that i've experienced has gotten kind of progressively harder because everyone wants in on it um so i will keep trying to learn them but they're they're definitely tougher for me personally than otc pumps um you know david the laptop legend would say differently he really understands them super super well and actually finds these easier than otc pumps but again it's it's different experiences it's different uh personalities and so forth so that's why you see here uh, 85 grand, but now it wasn't 100 grand. Now I did make 100 grand on CLU, but why is it only 86 grand here? Um, this was also again, another similar play to uh, INTV with BEGI. Um, same idea, it's this crappy OTC, um, related themselves to blockchain um, or, or Bitcoin at least. And during this period, I took some shares long. Um, at one point I was up quite nicely when it ran to 14. This the wick is not a misprint and actually did do that. Um, unfortunately, I was on vacation, so I completely, like I'm vacation as I didn't even look at the market that day. Totally missed that. Um, so super frustrated. But again, it was such a small amount of money, regardless, that like INTV, I made the mistake of just kind of forgetting about it, unfortunately. You know, it's really pretty ir irresponsible to me, but again, I had such a small dollar size that I had no really stop loss per se. Um, again, I kind of just tried to let crypto and Bitcoin play out. It didn't. Um, and so unfortunately, once that realized, once I kind of just kind of took a good hard look at my account of my, that I wear, I swing these. I'm like, yeah, uh, I, I forgot about this, you know, not great. Um, but I did decide to sell it. So I lost about, I think like 13 grand or so, um, you know, lost like 90% of <laughs> my position. That's why you see like the, my, I think that's this right here, this 95% biggest luck percent loss and why my averages are all messed up. Cause they just, yeah, you get it. But, um, so yeah, lesson learned there. Just I can't. I either I either have to put a stop loss in, or put some kind of meaningful amount of money. But even then, INTV I had a, I mean I had a big huge profit and still didn't take it. Um, so that's like the double edged sword of caring and not caring about the money. Um, I either just shouldn't swing these, um, or put in a stop loss. So and again, that's why I really don't. That's why swinging hasn't been my, the reason why I'm up three point three million. Like it's been day trading and it's been swing trading short wise, not on the long side. So um, that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, like I said, just the, 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 the big reminder for me of just the, the few decisions that are differently made, um, between, again, like I said, BEG, BGXX, TNON, VEDU, um, all of them. I mean, just the, just a little bit difference of, of, of decision-making could really change your trading, um, for the good and for the bad. So if you're, you know, like, like me, if you're a profitable trader, um, one bad decision, or even like last month with, with, uh. VERU, right, caused me to have a red month. Just one terrible, poor week of trading and a couple couple key decisions throughout that week. Vice versa, if you're a unprofitable trader and you're struggling, um, 
do this with your trading till st as well. Still look at just the key little decisions that if you would have made differently or that would have been a smarter decision or to maybe follow your trade plan better in any way, shape or form based on your trade plan or your setup that you're trading. Um, see how that would have changed things. Because again, it's the margin of error is so small that I think a lot of you would be surprised at how more profitable you actually would be. Now, can you be perfect? No, don't be like, oh, if I shorted the top and covered the bottom, I would have been made so much money. Like, no, still like, go through the trade plan of how you should have traded it and just look at those key decisions that you made that, you know, if made just a little bit differently, didn't cover here, maybe waited for an entry there. Um, it makes a big, big difference. And that's something I've always kind of done. Uh, I think just that this month in particular just amounted to much more money. Um, so yeah, I think I've rambled on enough in this video. Thanks so much for watching guys. Uh, excited to see how June goes, you know, uh, like I've, I think I've talked about it before, you know, this, this year has been very different in general. You know, we're in a true, true recession that we've been waiting for for 10 plus years. Um, small cap market has been way different uh, in this year compared to previous years. We'll see how that plays out going forward. You know, at the end of the day, just going to try to trade the best I can, keep improving, and hopefully keep pulling out these profitable months. So thanks so much, guys. I will see you guys next time.